Okay, I'm starting to get kind of a numb hand polishing all these cars, but uh, I did do a video on this one after having let it sit for, oh gosh, about maybe four years, could be a little longer, and it's always fun, you know, getting them back out, and uh, kind of like uh, Christmas morning, you know, every every half a decade or something, having the fun of, of uh, uncovering things and looking for little issues that may have occurred, you know, I mean, you put away a a good car, hopefully you'll get a good car out. I've been, like a lot of you, plagued with mice, but uh, I'm a lot wiser now. And uh, it's from everything from fabric softener sheets to toilet bowl cleaner <laughs> and watching and traps and everything in the right environment you put them in. Anyway, uh, this one is the chrome. It was optioned in the chrome package. You'll see a lot of chrome accents. And... Uh, around the marker lights and around the uh, light doors and uh, obviously the bumper and the key excursions and door paddles and uh, it's a hard top and that to me was a lot of the appeal when I when I got and found uh, found this one you know my pop used to tell me hole in your roof hole in your head don't be an idiot and you know I mean I, nobody could have stopped me at the time and like a darn fool I didn't listen but man he, he was right he was right. So opinions are many. I'd like probably a power moon roof. What do you call those? Uh, Astro roof or whatever. I don't know. Uh, the GM powered roof. You know, if I had anything, those did have drains in all the four corners down, you know, hoses down the, I think, uh, down the A pillars and the B pillars. Don't remember much of a problem, but oh my God, the T-tops, my friends in the trim department turning on those showers for hours just broken of their very will trying to get them not to leak and you know you get everything all nice and adjusted and you'd fix that leak and then you'd open a door with the window up and the the blow clip wouldn't allow the glass to sit and what are you going to do tell the owner hey put that glass down a quarter inch and then when you shut the door put it up and oh man just no way to win you know i mean if everything wasn't absolutely perfect you, you know two words you lose and after that, you know, the size and weight of the doors and the bushings, after a while they compromised, the doors would hang, and even though when you shut them, they would, uh, you know, the strike latch would push them up. It was a, it was a constant plague, and uh, I mean, gosh, you know, you know, in a simple example, just trying to drive up the highway and, and hear yourself think without what sounded like a, you know, a tornado coming through there <laughs> with the wind. And that's what I remember the most. Anyway, you know, that's just, you know, there there also is the appeal, the sexiness, the the uh the the way that the thing looks and the narcotic of summer, you know, on a warm day and uh you know, you're a young man and you know, but anyway, I guess one cannot understand the full import of such a remark until you've had a T topped car. And um that's why I like this one, because it doesn't have anything. You know, it's got that hard roof. What a difference. Even putting it up, you notice, you know, you feel the doors and stuff. They don't bind or anything. Anyway, the rigidity uh, is what I'm after in that remark. You get a teapot car, you put it up, and heck, you have to slam the doors because the, the things move so much. And I don't care how perfect the uh, the hoist is. So, yeah, there uh, there is a difference, and there's ways to countermand that with uh, brace kits and so on. But... Uh, I never saw one or had one with a B pillar crack or, or broken welds, but you know, I suppose the guys that roughhouse their cars were more victims of that sort of thing, and those would be the ones that uh, sawed open their hoods and bored holes through their hoods and mounted tacks and uh, uh, scan master or whatever the heck it was, and and gosh, what else? Uh, valve springs and fuel pump hot wire silliness and come on voltage is voltage those fuel pumps are dead at 100 pounds of pressure you need a hot wire kit that, that's the craziest thing I, I don't know i never did understand that anyway different strokes for different folks so uh, guys would do different things if it isn't bone stock uh, with a nice little chuggle or a surge then i myself am not interested so everybody everybody is of a different opinion and there's mine so um that's this car uh it's fun to drive. I did take it to a car show, this one, and gosh, I couldn't even garner passive interest. Nobody even stopped the, the talk. And, you know, I guess, you know, with the pneumatics and the gigantic 50-inch wheels and, you know, the hydraulics, if they don't jump, then 
there isn't that interest. And you know, again, I I, I don't uh, I don't understand that, but um, could be my area or whatever. I don't know. So they may have to ripen a little bit with time. And uh, you know, if everybody recognizes the the two words Grand National, and uh, you know, I guess to me this is is a Grand National and. You know, I don't break it down into finite detail with aluminum brake drums and plastic bumpers and weight and all that. Come on, it's the same thing, only it's white. And in the end, we got uh, we got three GNXs at our at our flagship dealer. We we were the first dealer in the in the nation, uh, first Buick store. And uh, I can remember too the uh, the how not well these cars these new. Uh, G bodies with the sequential fuel injected turbos, you know, were were they weren't they weren't well received, and a good many people, oh no, you don't, more of that, huh? You know, I mean, my gosh, oil pump failures and Melling's oil pumps with taller gears and plates we had to put in and soft plug failures and turbos that failed, uh, mostly due to faulty feeder lines, the oils of the time that would clog those feeder lines, starving for oil then and. Uh, the terrible adding insult to injury with the pump gases of the time, nobody wanting to put premium fuel in the cars, cold drivability, carburetors back in the genesis of all things, and then trying to triple C those carburetors, entering the OBD-1 platform with a, with a thing called an oxygen sensor and a mixture control solenoid with a paddle that clicked in a carburetor where sometimes the metering rods would stick. Those are, <laughs> those are hard times. Those were hard times, and then you know it's a good uh, it's a good analogy. You went from unthinkable to unsinkable because most again back to that remark didn't want anything to do with us. Oh no, you don't. Not all that all over again, and uh, or so said the salesman. But then you know something here was different, and you know if you took reasonably good care of your of your newer uh, design, it would uh, it would go the long haul for you. It was still non counterbalanced. They weren't cold blooded animals. They didn't run where the dam, especially at idle, especially the T types, which weren't turbocharged. But I mean, you put those around twelve, thirteen hundred RPMs. I can remember looking at the dashboards on those, and they were a blur, a literal blur, along with the rear mirror. Look, trying to look at it from the shake of those non, of those non counterbalanced engines. But they were still a, a nice looking. I'm talking car about the T type centuries here. And, uh, what we had a pace car, what back in '76, I can remember, and it all kind of started from there. And it was it was fun to watch it, uh, fun to watch it evolve. So we had a stall diagnostics protocol for these uh, three liters and three eight liters. What in the young cars, Grand M mostly in the Pontiac lineup were the three liters. They were all right, they were shakers, but uh, aside of all the mechanical problems, oil pressure problems, soft plug problems, that uh, particular booklet that we get. And I just hit that four-known horn. Boy, that's loud and nice. You've heard it on the other ones. Uh, would outline us replacing a crank sensor with a newly designed sensor, replacing the prom and exchanging it with one that would remap the fuel, that would, what, perhaps multiply the, the uh, spark tables or modify them, reschedule the torque converter to a higher rate of... Uh, of apply and uh, you know just try to fatten up and enhance drivability a little bit and uh, it did it helped and you know things were still evolving and um, you know I think uh, in that same type of a thought we'd uh, tighten down some power districts and and uh, add some ground redundancy and we'd look at connector integrity and that kind of thing and uh, wiring and ground studs and again adding more ground redundancy and you know, as a kind of a protocol, because all of a sudden, you know, these people would go nuts, you know, hey, I'm telling you, it quit. Well, it doesn't, it meets factory specs, we'd say, and it doesn't quit now. And after you laughed it off a little bit, you know, well, not my problem, I didn't build the damn thing. Oh, no, 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 it got serious. And, you know, you could be killed. So when these things would just pow at random quit, there was a, there was quite a panic. And yeah, yeah, you do, uh, you do remember the urgency of the, uh, of the time. So we did our best in adding more injury to insult at the Buick dealership. We had the Opal platform, and then that finally died, so that was a day to celebrate. Never did like those Opals at a Buick Opal dealership. So um, we got through it, and, um, you know, we had the E-bodies, which were what, the Rivieres, the LeSabres. Oh, man, they were beautiful. I remember a, a LeSabre Palm Beach edition. Look that one up. 
though that one was not turbocharged. The, the uh, LeSabre T-Types were, uh, gosh, that was a pretty car. And in the interior, I think to this day, is the nicest interior I can ever remember seeing uh, in the Buick lineup. And these were nice uh, too, you know, but uh, just depended on how you optioned them. But there was a difference, you know, and you look at all the cars now, for example, and aren't they? They're all the same and different, different but the same, all the same bug-eyed shit, you know. But back in this era, there was a difference. So Chevrolet had their Monte Carlo, and they were proud as proud got. And, man, they were a sleek-looking, beautiful thing. And Olds had their Hearst edition with their with their V8. They couldn't put a rocket in it, could they, you know? So they went with a 307 and put a, a bit of a, an aggressive cam in it, and it was respectable, but, you know, it was Buick in the end with their with their 3.8 uh, turbo package and two words, you lose. So nobody knew what to do, and Buick was that year, and, and in these years, the bread, and why Olds and Chevrolet, and I think all the way down to to the uh, Corvette platform was beaten that year, or we're just uh, we're left with crumbs. <laughs> that's what I remember. So uh, that's a V6. I can't believe it. And so said the salesman. But I mean, man, the things really moved. And uh, and I can remember. Uh, uh, I never saw it myself. But if you neutral slam these, they'd shear the wheel lugs right off. Now I never saw that. But you know, I mean, the myth sometimes is born the legend, right? <laughs> I don't know, and in the end we got uh, we got three G and X's uh, at our store, and again we were the uh, we were the flagship dealer, and there's quite a story behind those. But you know, gosh, you go out and you think about it, and and uh, you can see them still in your mind, and rows and rows of them, and then we put all our Glenn Ford full size cardboard posters back in the parts department, and then later, of course, they found their way to the dumpsters. He he did ads for Buick back in the uh, back in the eighties, early eighties, if I recall. Uh, Glenn Ford, the actor, and you know, yeah, you just uh, you reminisce and you remember, and uh, you know, those were those were fun times. So unlike all the others, this one's kind of unique, and in that it does have that chrome package, and uh, it still has the original paint, the enamel paint. And one day I'll probably have to do those bumper fillers, but well, right now it's uh, it's holding up. So just another variation, and it is. Uh, uh, you know, the same as the others, only, you know, no two are ever alike, right? That's what makes uh, life interesting. And uh, I don't see a lot of these. I don't see a lot of them anymore anywhere, you know. There, there are a lot of them sitting in yards and stuff still, but uh, this particular this particular platform is, is getting hard to find. And, yeah, well, you look on Craigslist, I think the Hearst Olds, uh, platforms are probably what I see the most. I mean, man, that was supposed to be a rare car, and they're everywhere, you know, and I got one of those, too, 83 and 84, but, um, you know, a lot of guys put those uh, big block motors in them and horse around with them, and uh, I'm, again, an all-stock guy. So there's lots of lots of room, and we all love our cars, and, uh, you know, yeah, there's a few in my area, even, and we have uh, we have fun talking about uh, talking about these sorts of things. So it was a neat uh, it was a neat uh, time back in the in the dealership setting, you know, both good and bad. But uh, wow, I mean, all of us we were so in want. I wanted one of these so bad, and years later I would find and and get uh, as many as I could uh, find. And and can't you? You know, you can have anything in life you want to work hard for it, and I did, and day and night to have it. Uh, but that want never, never, it was just a bug, you know, like the kind of the train thing I've said in the past. That bit me and I would never let go. And, uh, you know, anyway, I got my kettle of fish and collected them. But, you know, I don't suppose there's any example of a hobby where there's good return and these don't seem to garner that return. Maybe they will later, don't know. But uh, up to now, I've pretty much lost on every one that I've had. But, but I had a lot of fun and you can't put a price on that, I guess, right? That's the first stage of denial. <laughs> After that, it's an I told you so from the wife. I don't even want to go there. <laughs> so uh, that's pretty much it, I guess. And I hope you enjoyed this uh, this clip and of, uh, of this era car and uh, roll me a comment. And I think probably the next one I'll get out is my, uh, is my 1980 uh, example. Uh, that was a sport coupe I kind of created, and I'll go into that when I do it. Okay, take good care. Thanks for watching.